Hello, everybody. My name is Mona Shah. I will be moderating this quite unique and interesting panel. Before I introduce um, our distinguished panelists this uh, this afternoon or morning, wherever you are, I, I do want to just spend a second to um, go over what topic we have here today, because it is a little different. And I, I want to make sure that we're not going to be overlapping another topic, which you um, which, which is on this later this afternoon. So we are discussing consumer trends, uh, especially high net worth individuals during COVID and how they've shaped hospitality in particular. Um, hospitality investments, mostly around the world, but as a little in the US as well. We really want to discuss the whole concept of revenge travel uh, and revenge travel again with our overseas high net, uh, high net worth individuals. Um, and how high net worth individuals themselves are seeking to capitalize on um, the, the entire revenge travel phenomena. Uh, US, is it still one of the most desired places in the world? Are we looking at more competition from other countries? We're going to discuss that also. And we're also going to discuss how high net worth individuals from the US themselves are looking um, to seek second citizenship overseas. So with that, I'm going to just quickly introduce our wonderful panel. I'll start with you, Mohammed. Mohammed Asaria, Managing Director at Range Developments. And I believe your, your projects, um, Range Development projects, Mohammed, are all out in the Caribbean. Yeah, I know that's correct. We're in St. Kitts, Dominica and Grenada. Great. Um, you're a board member of uh, Range Developments, which is an international luxury hospitality development company. You develop luxury resorts on the Eastern Caribbean under the Citizenship by Investment program. Um, you were born and raised in the UK, as was I, um, and you uh, you have a dual background in law and investment background, uh, back in banking. And you're also a graduate of Trinity College, Cambridge. I didn't know you went to Cambridge. Um, I know, it's yeah, some time ago. Huh? It's, uh, <laughs> right. You, your interest structured in finance and investment banking led you to HSBC prior to ranging range developments. And uh, range developments has now grown to become one of the leading citizenship by investment developer in the Middle East, sorry, in the Eastern Caribbean, even though you are based in the Middle East. Um, Range Developments is the only developer to have completed two five-star resorts under the Citizenship by Investment Programs, the CBI as we often state. Park Hyatt, as you say, St. Kitts, Cabri Resort, Spark, uh, Kempinski, Dominica. Um, and Range Developments has gained a reputation for developing ultra-luxury high-end resorts that are transformational. <laughs> Thank you, Mohamed. Thank you, Mona, for the kind words. <laughs> Chris, Christopher Janu, founder and managing partner of the Urban Hotel Group and Urban Africa Capital. Manhattan native, Christopher, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm missing it home right now. <laughs> Chris is the developer and investor active in a range of development sectors, including hospitality, commercial property uh, development, and media in Africa. Uh, the group includes the Urban Hotel Group, a pan-African rollout of lifestyle hotels, and Urban Africa Capital, a developer owner operator of retail shopping centers and mixed use commercial real estate. Janu is also an author, your first book, uh, The Internationalists, which is a sweeping look at emerging markets as technology, globalization and demographics have defined forces. Um, and wow, I did not know this until I saw your bio, Chris, but you were knighted in 2016 for development services to Africa. Wow. <laughs> yep. He and your young family reside in Cape Town and Lusaka. Permanently in Cape Town or permanently, I thought, you, you're nothing in the US? You know, I, I, I still have an apartment on West 4th Street, but, um, you know, now with young kids, it's kind of Cape Town. <laughs> Well, I love Cape Town. Beautiful place. All right. And that brings me to Irene. Uh, welcome, Irene. Irene, um, you're going to pronounce your last name for me. Piso Yanaki. It's very difficult. It's Greek, I know. <laughs> I didn't want to butcher it. I did spend a few it's minutes. It's okay. Before. Don't worry. Even the Greeks cannot pronounce it. So no worries at all. <laughs> if I needed a career, definitely wouldn't be with my last name. <laughs> 
Um, that's well, that's wonderful. You bring more than 10 years of experience in the real estate market, well known for your expertise knowledge on the Greek immigration policy of the golden visa, though, though we do call golden visa. We have termed lots of countries golden visas. I know there's a little bit of a confusion on that, and I'll bring I'll come back to that. Uh, but making you an expert in sales and management, you're head of the sales and operations um, of MIBS Group, which is a highly respected company with a history of 40 years in uh, yes. hotel development and commercial real estate in Greece. Um, and you oversee all of the activities, training and supervising of the sales and property management. And of course, uh, you encounter, you daily encounter potential clients worldwide. Um, and most important is the fact that Irene is providing excellent service to buyers, um, the value added trust that the clients place in you, um, and you strive every day to exceed uh, to their expectations. Welcome, Irene. Thank you for having me here. It's a all pleasure right. meeting you all. <laughs> <laughs> and for anyone who doesn't know me, um, my name is Mona Shah. I'm, I was also born in the UK and raised there. I was a Crown Prosecutor in the UK before I came to the United States. Um, I have over 28 years now of legal experience. And uh, although they call us immigration lawyers, because we do mostly EB-5, we call ourselves um, immigration corporate. Um, I've received many accolades for my, my work, including being top 25 lawyer for seven years. Um, I'm a, a LexisNexis editor. I write frequently. I'm also a um, part-time adjunct professor at Baruch College. I regularly speak worldwide and attend. We do lots more than just law. We do a lot of marketing. In fact, we've raised millions in uh, investor capital for the EP5 program um, since 2011. Um, and I've been quoted by major newspapers like uh, New York Times, um, uh, Axios, Bloomberg, and I've also been interviewed by many magazines and newspapers. Um, but anyway, enough about me. Let's get straight into the, the topic at hand. And I'm going to start a little backwards. I'm going to talk a little bit about this whole revenge travel phenomena. Now, I, I know that this has this was something which started in the middle of last year, and it seems that it started with the Chinese because the Chinese started their revenge buying. And uh, it was something like um, somewhere like in April of last year, I think Hermes store ran 2.7 million in one day as all the Chinese did their revenge buying. And the pundits are out there saying that they're going to be the first out to do the revenge travel. Um, all right, so I'm going to just go around the, the corner at this point and see what everybody thinks about the phenomena of revenge travel, um, mostly not necessarily for, for, the, for the US, but for overseas. Mohammed, can I start with you? Sure. So, Mona, I'm living in Dubai and Dubai has been, you know, pretty much back to normal for the last, I'd say, since December. Um, hotels, luxury five star hotels are full today in town. Restaurants at the highest end, very difficult to get bookings. Um, we have people coming in from all over Africa, Russia, India. Um, so, you know, if there is a city which today is experiencing a boom because of revenge travel, Dubai is it. Yes, precautions are still being taken. Masks are being worn extensively. COVID tests are being done when you land um, and you get your results within four to six hours. So I think, you know, if Dubai is a few months ahead of the rest of the world coming out of this, if we can, if, if the world is, you know, trying to project what's going to happen or the Western world project what's going to happen in six months, Dubai is a good model. Um, well, and that's with... for a second then, Mohammed, can I ask you, do you think that the hotels in Dubai have made up in this revenge travel in these few short months, um, all of the losses or at least started to make a comeback? Comeback, yes. But look, I mean, supporting a hotel for nine months with no revenue, um, a high percentage of staff costs, uh, sky high utilities, maintaining that property, insurance, all the fixed costs that goes with a hotel owner, um, very difficult to make back in a few months. I mean, you know, recovering, recovering that loss, it's a year, it's, it's two years. I mean, we have properties in the Caribbean, as, as you mentioned during the introduction, um, they've just begun to open. Um, we're seeing heavy bookings for the second half, in particular quarter four coming in. Um, and what was interesting is we had a number of MICE events booked in 2020, the second half of 2020. Those customers didn't 
pull back and ask for their deposits back. They just ask for it to be deferred. Oh, so yes. I, I think everyone, you know, a lot of people, you know, always felt the world would be returning once again. Um, and and yeah, let's let's hope it's the second half of this year in the U.S. The U.S. returns to some level of normality, and the Caribbean becomes a beneficiary of that tourism. I read an article a few hours ago that I think it's Carnival or Norwegian Cruise Lines announced today that it's actually having record bookings, and it has um, it has some some regulations that you have to be vaccinated. But you know they stood up and said we're having a, we're having a fantastic run, and let's hope that trickles across all elements of the tourism industry emanating out of the U.S. Well, that is surprising because it was the cruise liners which had the worst effects, uh, you know, a year ago. And I I know a lot of people are saying things like, I don't ever want to go on a cruise again. So to have that, that, that's wonderful. Um, Irene, what are you thinking about seeing in revenge travel? Well, definitely also um, because of COVID-19 has affected a lot of uh, Greece since uh, Greece, you know, it's uh, primarily a touristic destination. Imagine that... uh, uh, nearly every year we have like 37 uh, million tourists coming and imagine that Greece, uh, the population is 10 million. Uh, so you can imagine that uh, during COVID we have visited a lot. So we are expecting now to overcome this. We have already started, you know, uh, early bookings uh, for uh, summertime. Greece is a um, uh, touristic destination during summertime mostly. Uh, so, yes, uh, we are seeing that uh, the revenge travel will, hmm. well, I actually... uh, will affect us as well, and we are waiting for it, but it's very difficult, you know, uh, to, uh, to back up for the past few months that have been lost, but uh, we are expecting uh, a lot of people coming the following month, so that... Oh, sorry, your your internet is not doing too it's a good well. thing. And also, a lot of uh, hotels that have been expanding. Even ah, okay, you've lost me. <laughs> yeah, we lost you for a little bit. Let me let me back up. I'll come back to you. Um, I actually found an article which stated the top ten outbound destinations after COVID, um, and and the Europeans were really on the top of the list as being because the Europeans have had a few more lockdowns than we have had here. Uh, it was bad enough the one we had here in new york last year but the top 10 outbounds have been named at um, japan at 18 percent thailand at 14 percent europe at 14 percent maldives singapore new zealand australia south korea sri lanka and malaysia there's no us no africa chris no revenge travel coming here what do you see coming to africa or in in uh, amongst yeah. africans well, amongst well, Africans, well, coming to the U.S. or going to Africa, though, you know, Africa and, and the U.S. is not on the list. Yeah, no. It's, so, what, so what I'm seeing is it, um, South Africa had a very hard lockdown. Uh, it was one of the longest lockdowns in the world. And so I'm, what, what a lot of my peers are doing is they're going, they're traveling locally. So I see a lot of travel to parks and, you know, island areas, but, but there's not a lot of tra- international travel in Africa because a lot of the the routes have been suspended, and that's been uh, that's been probably the the the, the biggest culprit. Uh, and and one other thing, um, economically, uh, Africa has been devastated by the lack of international travel. So I think um, you know there's local travel, but 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 um, you know not not a lot of revenge travel. Yeah, I I totally I totally see that. Um, all right, so moving on a little bit. Um, I'm sure revenge travel is going to come back into our our discussion. Um, I'm going to stay with you, Christopher, for a second. We've seen a new phenomena last year. Maybe you're going to say this is not so new. And I know Mohammed's going to say, no, 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 this is not new at all. But uh, citizenship by investment is something all three of you work on. And really, for the first time, we are seeing the US looking at purchasing property overseas in order to have second citizenship. So, <laughs> Chris. Yeah, no, it's a, it, it, funny enough, you know, so all the kids in my family, my, my, my brothers have dual citizenships. And, uh, you know, my, my, one of my brothers wanted to give up his American citizenship and keep his UK passport for tax reasons. Um, 
there. Uh, yeah, that usually used to be the reason, and I think that was the reason for the Caribbean. Um, but I, I've read that the increase in citizenship by investment over the last year during COVID is because people were scared of being uh, unable to move, and they wanted the second passport for that reason. Have you seen that? That, 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 that I've seen a lot. In fact, uh, Americans in Africa were getting stuck um, because they, they can't go to Europe. Um, and they don't want to go back to the States. Um, so it was, it, it, it's, it, I, I can see now that that would be of, 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 of great interest. I mean, you know, the pandemic hopefully is almost over, but um, having a dual citizenship would have allowed people of, to move a lot easier because the American passport was dead in the water for a while during, during the, the, the peak COVID time. Mm. Mohammed, do you have any thoughts about Americans? you going out of America for, with dual citizenship um, or you know, going into the CBI program? So Simona, if you look at citizenship by investment over the last 12 months, it wasn't driven primarily as a travel document or the ability to, to, to fly around the world. It was a hedge against some of the anxieties we're all facing, be those political, social, or economic. And I think individuals in the United States were facing a dual challenge last year. Um, obviously you had COVID and then you had all the rhetoric surrounding the end of um, President Trump's um, tenure. And people were talking about people on the street and all sorts of things. And this was creating a lot of anxiety in the minds of the high net worth individual. Um, and we saw the beneficiary of some of that anxiety being the Caribbean. It was so near the United States an Expedia second passport. Um, and people were planning that, God forbid, if the political headwinds or the healthcare challenges got too high, they could repatriate to an island where, you know, it wasn't really subject to the same tensions and public health challenges, um, which is only three to four hours away from, from mainland United States. And I think that really drove a number of high net worth individuals to explore second citizenship and execute on that. Um, and then the cherry on top of that, as Christopher mentioned, was that the passport was dead in the water. So this was a, an added benefit. But I think the primary driver was just trying to hedge some of those, um, some, some of those political challenges um, that the, the US was facing. Yeah, well, that brings me to another topic here. Um, dealing with high net worth individuals, a lot of the high net worth individuals didn't really lose out. Unfortunately, it was a certain class. Um, and it's always the blue collar worker, unfortunately. But what I, we did note um, in the past year is that we certainly had a lot of inquiries from high net worth individuals around the world. And many of them were looking just to purchase a second home, not necessarily for citizen, not necessarily uh, obtain citizenship. Irene, did you see an increase in people just looking for another home in, in uh, Greece last year? Yes, definitely. It has been a huge increase because, you know, uh, Greece does not offer yet the passport. Uh, so it's after the seven years uh, of uh, staying here in Greece, you can get the passport. Uh, so majority of the investors that they are coming here, they're not looking uh, for the uh, citizenship. Uh, they're looking for the second home. Uh, so we have a lot of people purchasing like this and we have a lot of people coming here and living as well like for um, a period of time like uh, for three months, uh, four months, six months. Uh, it's very important because they feel safe here in Greece, especially during the COVID period. Uh, so okay, of course uh, we have been affected because people could not come here uh, because of the restrictions. Uh, but uh, we managed and we had uh, a lot of interaction, um, uh, you know, through virtual tours, through um, online viewings, and uh, the requirements stayed uh, high. And we proceeded also with many sales uh, for people that they were requesting set of homes in Greece. Mm -hmm. So what portion of, of people, of high net worth individuals coming in, did you see wanted second homes versus um, CBI, citizenship by investment? Uh, nearly 70% here in Greece, oh, they wow. are reaching for second homes, second houses without wow. being, yes, it's, it's, uh, it's very high, but okay, they got the residence permit, they have the golden visa, they have the, you know, they can, um, uh, they can travel freely around Europe. 
but uh, they don't acquire the passport. So, um, uh, but even even that they don't care. Majority they, they want to have that. They want to have a second option here in Greece, and uh, especially during COVID nineteen, it's very important to mention that you know here in Greece it's not we're only in the capital for million. So, you know, people feel safe here and especially with the revenge travel that we were mentioning before, um, people will try to have uh, to, to go to places that they have open spaces, they have beaches. Greece has a coastline uh, that, that one of the biggest in Europe. So that's why it's very popular again with uh, the revenge travel in Greece because of that. People will go to the beach, will, will be on open spaces because they don't have, you know, uh, they don't have the fear of, for closed spaces. I presume Dubai as well, it's one of the reasons that uh, it will have a lot of tourism, uh, um, revenge tourism. No, I think there's a different reason for Dubai, but a different reason for <laughs> but the uh, But overall, um, Mohammed, do you, did you see a, a difference this year in people who wanted just second homes? Because I know you do both. You do both CBI and you sell property to people who just want a home out there in Grenada or St. Kitts. Correct. So unfortunately, we didn't have any second homes ready when the pandemic hit. Um, we're, developing, we're developing them in Grenada at present, and we've seen a significant amount of interest. Um, but they're still about 18 months out. But I can say if they were ready, all six of these homes priced at seven million would have been would have gone. Um, yeah. People were looking for somewhere, a second or third home, somewhere near the United States, if that's where they resided and somewhere within a hotel complex um, where all the services were taken care of. What we did see, Mona, which I think you will find quite interesting, is a number of people relocate to our hotels um, in the Caribbean for extended periods, whether that's three, four, five months. Um, internet connections are fantastic in, in the Caribbean. Um, again, it's not far from the United States, same sort of time zone. So people came across with their families, um, because after all, being locked down in an apartment in an urban center is a very different and potentially traumatic experience than being in a luxury five-star hotel um, on a beach with all mod cons provided. <laughs> and it wasn't just the United States. I mean, even now we have a number of families who are staying with us from Christmas um, when the UK announced its second or third lockdown. Um, so I think after the first lockdown, people realized that was unpleasant and those with means, you know, planned what they were going to do um, in the, in the, in, when the second lockdown came. Hmm. Chris, yourself, how, what's your proportion of um, sales, well, pre-COVID, what was your portion of sales of, of second homes versus uh, CBI? So we, we, we don't really deal in, in residential real estate. We, we, we focus mostly on, uh, exclusively on commercial real estate, frankly. And so, you know, our relationship with, with the EB-5 program is that, you know, we're developers we, we, and we have a wide network in many, well, probably six or seven countries in, in Africa, which has 54 countries. Uh, and so they, they trust us to recommend projects, commercial projects, and it's more, this is more about, you know, Africans who are interested in the EB-5 program are really not interested in really even the investment. But their main thing is they want, they want a visa, they want a permanent residency. Yeah. And um, so I think it's quite a different market than, for instance, what Irene and Mohammed are, 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 are doing. My, my interested uh, high net uh, uh, network is, is really, they're, they're after the passport. And um, and then they want to get their return on you know they want return on capital then a return on investment um, so it's 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 quite different and I I recognize how the segments are different as Mohammed describes it because I've I've also seen that there there in in Cape Town for instance I'm seeing a lot of Swedes and a lot of a lot of French and a lot of UK people uh, you know get second homes in South Africa just because the the dollar and the euro is so strong there. So, but but it's a very different segment than than what, it, what what we work with in Africa. Yeah, Chris, why why Africa? Why are you there? Yeah, I made a wrong turn. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I was going to the Seychelles. <laughs> took you out there. Yeah, no. So, uh, you know, I, I um, we we started looking abroad uh, right after the global financial crisis, and it, it was a typical story. You know, we. 
I, I'd sold some companies in the United States, was looking for the next act. And, um, and after the global financial crisis, it looked like there were very few places where um, you know, there was you know, high growth potential. So um, after kind of traveling around the world, we, we, you know, we went to um, you know, Latin America and South America and India. Africa was where we saw the most opportunity and the least competition. And then it was really as, as, as direct as that. Most of the investors like me that are here, uh, especially if they've come from as far away as Manhattan and you know, are, are missing their, their regular Sunday nights at, at Balthazar, um, they're they're chasing yield. You know they're coming here because of the growth and and, and the margins and the IRRs and and the uh, and the scale, and that's why we're here. I mean, in a way, it's kind of the last frontier for 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 development at this scale. Well, interestingly, when when we raise money for uh, EB five, um, and, and we've been all over the world, um, Africa really has been it has come into the game a little later. Um, it's been the last two or three years we've been going out there, but I feel as though they came late into the game, as opposed to maybe some of the other countries. And we know countries like Korea and and uh, China were there many many moons earlier. But uh, do you get a, do you get an interest, Mohammed, for the CBI program from South Africa? Oh, oh, significant. countries generally. Yeah, significantly, and not just Africa. I mean, look, as Chris mentioned, Africa is a frontier market. And by definition, in a frontier market, you have more risk, but you have significantly higher returns. So the high net worth individual and entrepreneur is quite happy doing his business there. The ones that we come across do not want to relocate, but they need a second citizenship, which they can obtain without leaving their country. Um, within a three to four month window. And that's what the programs we offer provide. And the travel benefits that these programs provide, whether that's travel to the UK, Schengen, China, Russia, and 140 other countries around the world, is something that the African entrepreneur really values because unfortunately, visa-free travel is not something high up on, a, on the African passport potential. Um, the individual doesn't want to leave because he's, he's doing quite well there. But you know, the social, political and economic risks and the wind of political favor can change so quickly in Africa that that individual needs a hedge against some of that, some of those political challenges. So when the operating environment in some of these frontier markets ceases to work for that individual or his family, he has a plan B. Um, and that plan B may be a temporary home in, in Europe, it may be a temporary home in the UK, or very interestingly with our project in Grenada, it provides individuals the ability to live and reside in the United States under the E2 visa. Um, and that really works for the African investor because you know, Grenada E2 has cemented itself as an alternative route, in, an alternative and established route into the US, especially given you're not taxed on your worldwide income unless you spend 120 days in the United States. So the last thing that an individual wishes to be let's say he's making a lot of money in Nigeria by taking a green card or US citizenship to inadvertently be taxed on his worldwide income. So he can get the benefit of a second passport, the ability to reside in the US, God forbid, if there's some serious headwinds in his native land, plus the ability of, um, or plus the advantage of having a, quite an efficient tax regime in place. Right. Yeah. Well, this is a real estate um, expo, so I'm not sure whether people even know what an E2 visa is, Mohammed. So maybe you would like to explain what that is and why people can come and invest in Grenada and then somehow manage to get immigration to the United States. Yeah, no. So let me answer the second part of that question first. So Grenada has been very close to the United States since 1983, mm -hmm. since it was invaded by President Reagan at the end of the Cold War. And as part of the peace treaty, which was signed, um, Grenada citizens were given something called an E2 visa, which says if you're from Grenada, you have the ability to set up your own business or invest in a business in the United States for a hundred, $150,000 minimal investment. Um, and if your business plan makes sense, you and your family can obtain an E2 visa, which lets you reside in the United States for five year periods and which is renewable subject to that business still being viable and in existence. Um, so that is, the, that is the E2 visa. And what, your first question was why it's so desirable? Well, I'm coming to that. 
<laughs> ah, okay. What was I'm, the first question? Is, is what you no, asked me? Sorry. It was really just just that. Um, I'm sure there would be some listener there to say, "Well, wait a minute. How can investing in Grenada allow me immigration into the U.S.?" I have to say, these are two different uh, um, issues. In, what Mohammed is actually saying is that by investing in Grenada, you can quickly become a citizen of a country within a few months, which a lot of people do like. Other than and then with that citizenship, you are eligible for. The the E2 program here. And the E2 is a non-immigrant visa and it's an entrepreneurial visa. It's investing in the US um, uh, and, and in a business. And it's different from the EB5 program because you don't get a green card out of it. You are a non-immigrant visa. What is very popular for two reasons, as Mohammed mentioned. One, because a lot of people don't want to pay US taxes and they can still invest over here and have a business here without paying US taxes because they're not here long enough. Um, mm. And uh, the secondly because um it, it's so fast so those are the pointers i just wanted to bring out um and with the e2 visa though uh Mohammed, um are you noticing that there are more people coming into grenada wanting that as opposed to just buying a home or, or a second citizenship uh, sorry or a second second home there um half the investors we're seeing coming into grenada are driven by the citizenship for the citizenship purpose. You know, they're trying to alleviate a prejudice they're facing by their home country citizenship, whether that's travel or some of the other insecurities we touched upon. The other half of them are using it as a conduit jurisdiction. Um, and they may be from countries where obviously it doesn't have an E2 treaty in existence with the United States. And there's a very long backlog um, for the EB5. And they're using Grenada as a conduit jurisdiction, as a stepping stone into the United States. So I would say it's about 50-50 Mona. And obviously the popularity of Grenada has increased um, since the changes made by, by President Trump, whether those related to the EB-5, the L-1, the H-1B. Um, so Grenada has become a beneficiary of some of that demand. And the way, to, uh, the way to benefit from this program is you have to invest in Grenadian real estate become eligible for citizenship by virtue of that investment, and then you can progress into the United States if that's your ultimate aim. And it's an amazing way of providing alternative capital for projects, right? Because look, just like just like Christopher, I started my business in the Caribbean at the, the, the end of the last financial crisis. The debt capital markets were dry, okay? Especially in the Caribbean, which are kind of unfortunately littered with half-built hotels where a number of, whether it's the Euro Icelandic or European banks got very aggressive on some of the lending. But, you know, for new hotel development in the Caribbean, aside from us, there's been very few branded hotels developed in the last seven to eight years. The only capital has really been the CBI program. Um, and, you know, we've worked with the governments in St. Kitts, Dominica and Grenada worked on legislative enhancements to allow the pooling of capital under the citizenship by investment program to fuel the development of hotels. Um, and where I commend the governments is they've really chosen high-end tourism to be the beneficiary of this capital, given the job creation, the direct and the indirect economic impact, um, which high-end hotels create in a tourism-driven economy. Mm, you sound like an advert for one of our EB5 programs here. <laughs> Chris, are you, I'm going to ask you something very similar because I know you do dabble with EB5. So you do bring, you have brought in the past money um, um, back into the US for US projects. Yeah, that's right. So I, I got into EB5. Uh, so I was the chairman of the American Chamber of Commerce in Zambia for two years. I think because I was the only American in Zambia who would take the job. And the, the American Embassy wanted to really promote this program. Uh, and that's where I learned about it um, because it, it really is under the radar in Africa. And when you tell Africans, there's a, you know, essentially a golden visa program in the United States, uh, you know, they're flabbergasted because it just doesn't come up. Yeah. Um, but my, my, my thinking was, you know, I, I've got a lot of high net guys that invest with me because they were looking for yield in Africa um, and uh, vice versa. You know, having developments in Africa, there's a lot of people who would invest with us in the United States. Um, and so we, we dabble with uh, our own projects, uh, mostly in Florida, um, but also with EB-5 projects, just, just because it's pretty easy to sell a Four Seasons in New Orleans or, a, you know, 
of a, a you know some some kind of um, retirement home you know which is a reliable category um, and there's just so much interest in it uh, here in Africa and it's a fun story to tell to be quite honest. <laughs> well, the U.S. has always, always been a popular destination, so people are looking for ways to come in, and that's hence the alternative capital allowed by the EB-5 program is just yeah. a great source. Uh, but Irene, has the U.S. lost any of its its glamour, uh, maybe under the, the Trump administration or, or just generally? Are you still finding people are interested in coming to the U.S.? Yes, of course. U.S. is still a very strong market, and majority of people they would prefer to come to the to the U.S. To be honest, okay. But uh, also, Europe has starting to gain a lot of uh, you know a lot of attention, a lot of people that they also want to come here, and they really value also the the immigration policy of Europe. So uh, also we have a lot of demand in Europe. But okay, let's be honest. United States, it's always you know the, the top destination for majority of investors. Uh, but uh, that's why we're trying very hard in Greece as well, and we're trying to be very competitive so that we can offer investors, you know, uh, everything the best that we can in order to, to come here, lowest budget, um, the ability to travel in European countries, uh, they can have an investment here, they can get a rental return, they can have a residence permit um, with uh, very quick procedures within one month, they can get the residence permit. Uh, really cool. One month, wow. Yes, very, very fast, very quick, uh, very quick procedures. And now during COVID-19, government has also uh, made things better so that clients, uh, buyers cannot even come here. They can get, uh, you know, the, their blue cards from, from abroad. They can buy from abroad. What, which uh, countries, Irene, are you seeing? Uh, most, sorry? Which countries are interested in, in, in actually purchasing in Greece? Well, we have many, many people, many countries interested here, but okay, uh, majority, no, they're, they're from China, from Russia, from Ukraine, from Vietnam, and, uh, we have uh, all over the world, uh, from Dubai as well, from, from everywhere. Hmm. But majority, okay, it's the, the Chinese market, Vietnamese, Russians, Ukraine, because these are the people that they are in need of, uh, of living from their countries and in need of, uh, of having like a second home, a second solution. Right, uh, right. And, and it's very quick procedure here in Greece and uh, with the minimum budget. And also it's like they don't have, uh, they're not uh, being taxed uh, for their global income here. So uh, this is something also very important for them. The old tax, of course. Uh, uh, I, have, I have a question for you, though. I, I have read a lot about uh, the increase in real estate prices in Greece. Mm -hmm. And um, as much as, as a bit like our Canadian um, sort of counterpart here as well, there is going to be, or people have predicted that there may be a bubble. So you have people buying now and there's been an increase during COVID, but experts predict a bubble. What do you see? Well, uh, Greece has been in crisis uh, for the past seven years. So uh, up to 2018, there was a 50% decrease on prices. Uh, okay. So you can understand that now we are starting to increase prices again so now that's why now it's the best time uh, the best timing for someone to invest in greece because now it's the time that uh, we have the increase of property value and imagine that in 2018 we had like 50 percent decrease so uh, i i still believe that uh, the bubble is uh, just starting to <laughs> to grow so we have many years in front of us till the bubble burst again uh, so that's why I believe that it's, it's a good timing for the investment now in Greece. Mohammed, the prices have gone down in Dubai considerably. Bubble burst there? Uh, Mona, to the, to the contrary, in the last 12 months, I can tell you from personal experience, there's absolutely no product in the prime and super prime region. Um, mm -hmm. Villa prices have gone up 50% um, oh. in certain high-end communities. Um, Dubai is receiving new immigrants or migrants every day, be that from Africa, um, Russia, China, India. Um, Dubai is Dubai real estate is on a tear today, and you know there is a shortage of product in the prime and super prime. Yes, there is a lot of inventory still in the mid level, but as the high net worth individual, the very high net worth individual relocates to Dubai, because remember it is still a tax zero jurisdiction. 
and he sets up his family office, which is currently what's happening, then the next layer down of senior manager will come in within this next six to nine months. Um, and the benefits will be felt across the, across the economy. Imagine pre-COVID, golf courses had no waiting lists. They were waiving joining fee. Now their waiting lists are as long as ever, and they're being very strict on their on their uh, on their joining fees. So, you know, if Dubai is a barometer or bellwether of what's about to be seen at the top end of the the luxury sector in terms of real estate, the next six to nine months could be very interesting in the United States and the the Western Hemisphere. Well, and likewise, you deal with the luxury out in the Caribbean. And uh, if, if if a person doesn't want a second home out in, say, New Hampshire, they may actually come out to St. Kitts or Grenada. Yeah, correct. And again, it's a four hour flight to New York, a three and a half hour flight to Miami. Yeah. Um, convenient. Yeah. And, you know, when I mean, we pride ourselves on our de development philosophy, we build to the highest international standards. So when you present a luxury offering, which has all those components, that suddenly becomes a very attractive real estate to the high net worth individual, whether it's pride of ownership or in terms of having utility, God forbid, if there is a second wave or there is another virus, um, people, people want to be prepared for any future occurrences. Yeah, I agree. And I think uh, Dubai is one of those places where if you hold real estate long enough, you do get your money back. Correct. Like anywhere. I mean, real estate isn't real estate isn't like the stock market. You can make a quick buck. You know, the transaction costs associated with real estate. It is a it is a medium term investment, if not a long term one. All right. Chris, are you seeing um, a real estate increase in South Africa? No, actually, funny enough, it, it kind of uh, relates to a, a, a previous uh, uh, topic. Uh, what, what I'm seeing a lot in South Africa is the desire to um, uh, to take wealth out of the country, because there's there's a certain um, there's there's a lot of political uncertainty right now, and um, and the rand is um, it's not doing that great. And I've, I've been talking to real estate uh, uh, developers and homeowners or uh, brokers rather uh, at the very high end. And they say that, that that part of the market is actually extremely quiet because people are thinking more in terms of a political and economic hedge. And, and uh, that's that's what I see in Africa, also in Zambia, third place. Like most of these markets, in fact, for instance, we have a project in Aputo and a week ago, the whole north of, of Mozambique, you know, was was disrupted by, by um, jihadists. And, that's a typical Africa scenario where like one minute everybody's on and then the next minute everybody wants to leave and um, uh, and, and they want to get their money offshore. And so I think one, one of the attractions about the United States is or what I see is is this desire. I've, I've got some clients in Botswana. Their desire is they want to get their money into the United States, they want to make it here. They want to park it there and invest it there. And I see that as a sort of a, a component of the EB-5 because the one thing about the United States program, especially when you're dealing with with uh, um, commercial projects, is that these are you know some people don't necessarily want a vacation home. They 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 want to be part of that economy, and so if they can get a permanent residency in the United States, then they can you know invest in other businesses, another part of you know the biggest economy in the world. So it's it's really funny because you can segment these. These these groups, you know, Muhammad's uh, um, uh, network and Irene's network are they're they're very distinct and very different from what I see, um, which just goes to show you that that you really have to kind of kind of uh, tailor the the situation to the person or to the family um, because it's it's always so different. It is. It's true. I mean, there are 23 countries in the, around the world who do um, uh, main countries, which do the the, the the whole citizenship by investment. We're calling that. I know it's not necessarily uh, citizenship everywhere. Grenada, yes. But let's call it the golden visa. Um, so golden visa programs are usually programs where you can, where you're putting an economic benefit into a country and getting an immigration benefit back out of it. That's mm -hmm. that's definition here and we've seen more and more countries do this and more and more countries utilize this with covid and a lot of the countries and i'm going to ask you irene um 
is Greece doing something about getting more investment to perhaps make up for some of the losses from COVID, you know, uh, again, in the real estate sector or not? Uh, because the one thing the US is, is not capitalizing on it. We've introduced it. We've, we've tried. We've, we've been part of people who've gone to Congress and saying, look, use EV5, lower it or do something. But, uh, you know, the US isn't, isn't really use, utilizing that. But I think other countries are. Right. Well, yes, Greece, as I have uh, as I've already stated before, uh, the government is trying to make um, uh, step by step uh, everything better and attract more investors in Greece. Uh, so they are trying to do the program even better. Uh, they have already done. How much is it presently to invest in Greece to get uh, residency? It's it's the lowest budget, uh, the lowest uh, requirement, uh, two hundred and fifty thousand euros. It's the lowest in Europe. Uh, so. This is um, a very, very competitive um, uh, in the Mediterranean. And uh, also, I, as I have stated, it's the quickest one. Uh, you can have like a three generation policy if, with uh, one investment of 250,000 euros in the real estate. Uh, you mm. can have all the family members acquire the residence permit. So it, this is something very, very important. Uh, you don't have, we have no minimum stay requirement. So. Uh, we know that majority of our investors are businessmen, so they don't have the luxury to spend many days uh, uh, in Greece. So we have no minimum stay requirements. So if someone buys, doesn't have to come back again in Greece, but can travel freely all over Europe and uh, Schengen zone. Uh, and also something very important that they, they can even uh, live in uh, other countries in Schengen zone. Uh, so uh, this is a, a huge benefit uh, of uh, the golden visa program of the residence permit. Uh, mm -hmm. And as I stated before, uh, they don't have to pay. We don't pay any capital duty. You're not taxed for your global income. Uh, we have the lowest property tax um, in, in Europe. And uh, someone have the same benefits as Greeks here. For example, free education, uh, free hospital, uh, free healthcare system which is one of the best um, uh, in, in the world in Greece. Uh, so oh, even I'm going to pack my bags tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> and also imagine that if someone wants to get the citizenship, so we also have the, the passport. If someone wants, he can come and lives here for seven years, learn, learn the language and then can acquire the passport as well. So we have the citizenship. Uh, and furthermore, the government now made uh, another uh, in 2020, has launched uh, two new schemes. Uh, we'll have uh, the non-DOM scheme where someone can bring uh, their, uh, their taxes and can be all the, the income can be taxed in Greece and can pay an annual flat tax of 100,000 uh, uh, euros. Oh, so nice. this is also something very important, provided that they can uh, buy a property, make an investment of 500,000 euros here. Right. So also, government is trying a lot to, to attract investors here. I can see that. I can see that. Are we going to see any lowering of uh, the, the, the investment threshold rate in the European programs to take um, advantage of COVID? So look, certain countries already lowered their thresholds like St. Kitts and St. Lucia um, very early on. Um, Grenada stock firm it took the view that it has a unique offering, very wide visa-free travel, one of the few countries where you can travel to China, the unique access to the United States. And it's really developed a reputation for, you know, not compromising on its due diligence standards. And that's been acknowledged by the US ambassador to the Eastern Caribbean on a number of occasions. So it took the strategy that it's gonna keep its price firm um, and it's after quality, not after quantity in terms of that offering. And in the figures which were announced last week, real estate sales under the CBI program in the last 12 months or in 2020 increased by 106% compared to the previous year. Oh, wow. And I think that really shows um, that strategy worked because the high net worth investor is not looking for you know, a cheap program. He's looking for quality program. You talked about Hermes doing very well in China. I don't think the lower brands had that level of, of, uh, of volume of sale. Um, so you know, I think programs which distinguish themselves of being a quality program, tried and tested, 
you know, no one's no one's opening the tap in terms of price point or the quality of the, the, or, the or reducing the due diligence uh, checks being done. And I think those programs will really survive for the long term and will really come out of COVID shining um, and be the beneficiary of demand. Yeah, for the next I, I few happen years. to agree with you, actually. So um, unfortunately, uh, pan panelists, we aren't able to have a question and answer session, which we would normally be doing at this point. So I will take, um, and hopefully people would send us their questions and we can also always respond later. And we only have a few minutes left. Um, and Chris, I did not want to end this without mentioning your book. And uh... <laughs> it's on Amazon. Yes. It's a page turner. <laughs> no, it's a, so uh, it's, it's called The Internationalist, Globalization, the Age of Information and the Developing World Ascent. Well, but you can call it internationalist. <laughs> I feel like it has a different meaning now that we've been through COVID and everybody suddenly has understood, uh, you know, the, the benefits of, of technology and, um, you know, virtual meetings like this. That's a really neat point. And it, it, it has, it's, it's, what, what is also sort of re-resonating for me personally is that we've just gone through this tremendous populist period where it was globalization kind of became a bad word. But you know, when you live in Africa, when you, you know Dubai, uh, Athens, and particularly New York, when you're in an international city, you you can't turn your back on globalism and internationalism uh, because we're we're all so connected, you know, not just economically but spiritually, and uh, so it's um, uh, I I think it's coming back around and and. Uh, um, I'm excited to write the second one, which will be just about after. <laughs> well, so, perhaps we could have a little mention of the CBI. I, I always wonder if there's a way of, of really glamorizing the CBI programs, but uh, they're, they're a phenomenon within themselves and not, they're not so well known here. You know, the US have this, uh, unfortunately, we've had a lot of bad rap with the EB-5 program and we are looking at a new bill, which will change a lot of things, give it more integrity. And uh, I don't see much difference with the fact that we have had the change from 500 to 900 for, for our developers. Our developers love the fact that the minimum amount is 900. And, and Mohammed, I'm going to ask you, you know, just to before we wrap up, um, it's only 250,000 to invest in in Grenada, and yet you're you you must have you must have to have many many investors before you can really utilize the numbers for some of the luxury real estate that you have out there. Yeah, correct. So, you know, obviously with the lower investment threshold, you're given a higher allocation of citizenship um, or citizenship qualifying units by the government. And, you know, just like a project anywhere, whether it's in Africa, the United States or Greece or the Caribbean, you know, it, it, it involves a sales effort. You yeah. have to have the right people. You have to target the high net worth individuals. Um, and selling to someone at a price point of a million dollars is very different to someone at a price point of half a million and 250. So you just need the right strategy to find the right investor. Um, and, um, and yeah, one thing about this is it's a referral business because the first time people come across second citizenship, I think Christopher mentioned it before, they're just amazed. Is this true or is Mohammed, Mona and Irene just come blowing smoke? Um, <laughs> But once they've got that citizenship within three months, they've used it, they've gone to Russia, they've got their E2 visa, that individual then becomes a brand ambassador for everybody. Um, he brings his friends along. And those people who are not his friends look at him very enviously and they find us in any case. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it's about having successful applicants go through the conveyor belt and that's what fuels the business. Yeah. On, on both sides, because obviously they need you need good quality, uh, um, a good quality yeah. project, because isn't there a return of capital also when when you invest? Correct. So you've got two things. One, you have a return during the tenure of the investment. It's, it's an unleveraged investment. So it's two to three to four percent is what what you're going to make. But most importantly, the two hundred and twenty thousand that you invest in the relevant project, there's a five year hold period. And after that hold period, you can liquidate your investment by selling it to someone else who also wants to, to apply for second citizenship whilst you maintain your citizenship in perpetuity. So really your sunk cost is about $80,000, which comprises the government fees for a family of four. Um, 
and you've exited your investment after five years. So if you look at the benefits that $80,000 provides you, visa-free travel, uh, the ability to sleep at night if you're in an emerging market, the ability to relocate to the United States, that's a fantastic deal as well as the yield along the way and the ability to spend a few weeks at the resort every year. Um, so it really is a wonderful package when you look at it holistically. Well, let's hope uh, CBI continues to be popular amongst all the high net worth individuals. Um, panel, thank you very much. Uh, you've been wonderful. And uh, here you are, Anthony. Tell us. <laughs> I, I, I was quick. I, you didn't have to tell me. Time was up. <laughs> no, you're doing a great job. You guys were all fantastic. Mohammed, Thank you. Do, Mohammed, do our attendees get a free stay at your resorts? <laughs> <laughs> and, and the free stay starts tomorrow, Anthony, and it's for seven days starting tomorrow. So you better rush to the airport. <laughs> I know. But only for those only for those from Africa. So Christopher, uh, you're there welcome. You go. Chris will be there. Chris will be there I'm to in. sell his books. I'll, I'll meet you at the bar. <laughs> <laughs> Bring those boxes of your books, Chris, and autograph them. I will. Um, you got uh, it. Mona, thank you so much. Irene, Christopher, Mohammed. Thank you. Really, it was a great panel. I'm, I'm looking forward to doing more with these, uh, more of these panels with you, Mona, in the future. But again, really nice to have you guys, especially where you're calling from. And it was really an honor to have you guys on this panel. Um, once again, everybody, yes, there are a couple questions there about will you get the video? Yes, you will. This give us about four or five days and we'll make sure we give it over to Mohammed, I mean, I mean Mona, and she'll uh, send out a thank you note with your, you know, your content information if, uh, if you need to reach out to Christopher, Mohammed, or Irene as well. Uh, once again, thank you, guys. We have our next panel coming up in about 30 minutes. It's called The Capital Flows. Where is the global citizen choosing to deploy the capital in the post-pandemic world and why? Ber Berkshire's Hathaways and Inker Volkers will be the sponsor of that panel. So once again, thank you, guys. And this concludes our panel. Thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Thank you, Irene. Bye, bye, -bye. everybody. Bye-bye, everybody.